Thank you so much, Andy. So just before we start, before I hand over to our incredible panel that we have, I just wanted to do a quick a quick um, little icebreaker for everyone here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say three words. I'm going to, one by one, and if you feel positively about that word, I'd like you to stand up. Please do also take part. Um, and if you feel negatively about that word, I would like you to stay seated, okay? Make sense? Perfect, okay. So the first word is ice cream. How do we feel about the word ice cream? Okay. No, sorry, you have to choose. <laughs> Thanks, sorry, Swazi. Um, okay, we've got a mix. We have a mix. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come to you, Alex. Why do you feel positively about the word ice cream? Because it's my favorite pudding. <laughs> um, pretty much chocolate or anything else. Chocolate, mango, raspberry, love it. Versatile, very nice, I like that. Thank you so much. Um, anyone, Swazi, why, why have you stayed seated? I, I just feel it's a bit overrated, unless you're doing cookie dough ice cream. I just, I, you know, like, I'm, that's why I'm half there, but I'm not sold. It's a no for me. It's a no. Yeah, it's a no for me. Okay, no, I 100% agree. I think cookie dough is the way to go. My cousin said to me that cookie dough, and I really, I've stopped speaking to him after this, he said cookie dough was just lumps of sugar in ice cream. It's so much more than that, actually. So, yeah, okay, everyone take a seat. We're going to do two more. Um, so the next word is manners. How do we feel about the word manners? Interesting, interesting. And there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. Okay, okay, very interesting. Um, I'm going to come over here. Um, Lucas, why do you feel positively about the word manners? Um, no, from a young age, my parents always told me, like, it's important to say your pleases and your thank yous and just going through your day, if someone thanks you for something, you know, it, it feels nice. Very good, I like that, I like that. Um, I'm going to come over here. Um, Richard, why do you feel positively about manners? I was going to say something similar. It just makes you feel comfortable and, and good around people if they're polite to you so I like that I like that Wale I'm gonna come to you because you're seated can I ask you why you feel negatively about the word manners I'm seated because I've got no clue what we're going to hold in here okay, no, that's fine that's understandable okay that's absolutely fine um everyone take a seat and I'm just gonna explain this I'm so sorry Wale I literally put you on the spot apologies no, that's fine um so what we're doing so Stand up if you feel positively and stay seated if you feel negatively. We're going to do one more. This one's the most controversial, usually. So the last word is power. How do we feel about the word power? No, there's no in-betweens, Alan, sorry. It's either positive or negative. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to come over to Debs. Debs, why do you feel positively about the word power? Um, because power is such a useful thing. Um, my problem is not power, my problem is the misuse of power. But I think we have the power to do so many things. We have the power to hold this kind of event in a university that has the power to facilitate it. So power, when it's used for good, is powerful, excuse the pun. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Debs. Um, so everyone take a seat. Um, so. When we think about power, there are two main different types of power. So we have dominant power, which is the power we have, oh, you're, you're right, Swaz? <laughs> which is the power we have over somebody. And then relational power, which is the power we build between each other, okay? So dominant power, dominant power isn't always a negative thing. It can sometimes be a positive thing. But relational power is, is what we're doing right now. Relational power is about collaboration. It's about coming together. Um, well, we, used to, we all used to work together. And one of the things we used to say a lot of the time is your network is your net worth. So without further delay, I would like to pass over to our panel. So we have Janelle Mitchell, who is a, a, a brilliant DJ, who has done many a uh, brilliant gig, and has also won the Richard Anthony Scholarship for Music here at the University of Westminster. <laughs> Round of applause for Janelle. We have a Raymond Tanner, who, who asked me, to introduce him in this way. So I'm gonna introduce him in this way. The man, the myth, the legend. That's, 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 that sums up Ray. Um, Ray Raymond is a audio producer uh, and the, uh, the creator of Peace of No Mind, which is a podcast, um, which we'll be talking about later. And lastly, we have Swazi McCalley, who is a uh, 
BBC One Extra radio presenter. She also won the Kiss, Kiss FM's Chosen One in what year? 2016. Brilliant. So a round of applause for all of our panellists. And the way that we're going to run this is a little bit different. So each of our panellists are all, they are all hosts in their day-to-day -day role. So what we have is a, we will have the question on the PowerPoint and our three panellists will facilitate amongst themselves. Um, so I'll pass over to you to do introductions. Oh, can you give it up for Zara though? Let's go, Zara. We used to work together and she is A1 on all things banter. Okay, so introductions. Um, oh, I'm gonna, shall I just read the quote then? Embrace what makes you unique, even if it makes others uncomfortable. I didn't have to become perfect because I've learned throughout my journey that perfection is the enemy of greatness. Janelle Monet, who's a legend. Um, so yeah, I guess just a, a quick intro to who I am. My name is Swazi. I am a radio presenter at BBC Radio One Extra. I get up very early and go to bed very early on a Friday night because I have the breakfast show on a Saturday morning, 7 to 10 a.m. Um, but before that, I'll just be real quick with it. I joined a youth group in Ilford. So I'm an East Londoner. Hey, and do you know what? These colors are giving me very Guyanese colors because I am, <laughs> yeah. So, and my mum's name is Deb. So I feel like you're my mum in some, some weird frame of hair. So uh, my mum's side of Guyanese, my dad's side of Mauritian. Um, and so no one is in radio. No one has no business doing radio. So um, I won a competition in 2016 with no radio experience, but all the experience that I did have was when I became a Christian at 14 years old and I joined a youth group, um, part of Seagate's church. And every Monday we would do um, dramas. You split the group in two. And if you won the drama group competition thing on a Monday, you got to perform it at your youth group on Friday. And from Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, week in, week out, all of the skills of improv and confidence and getting things wrong and picking it back up and quick thinking, all those things, by God's grace, just gave me the foundation to do radio, to do hosting, to do events. And so I'm a product of a youth group. I cannot sing loud enough about youth groups um, and engaging with people and hosting people and all of those good things. So yeah, this, this quote here about perfection being the enemy of greatness, the church youth group I went to was so gracious, so kind, you would get it wrong. You're not perfect, you're learning, you're doing it again. And radio is very much like that. The microphone could go wrong, the speaker could blow up, the studio could go off air, but you just gotta be like, okay, the world did not end and there's a way to get around this. So yeah, very grateful for all the different things that I do in and out of radio, very grateful for the job that I've got. Um, and yeah, excited to be here. So thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. Okay, so I did tell Zara to introduce me as the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> But what I meant by that was less ego and more about like developing a love and the power within yourself and understanding your importance and your place, whether that's in a career perspective, whether that's your side hustle, whether that's in an institution, knowing the power that you bring into it. And that's something over the course of my professional like, experience have grown into and started to find out like, hold on, you know, no one is a better version of you than you. And I know that sounds cheesy, but damn right, I'm here. Um, but in the loveliest way, um, my name's Raymond. I'm an audio producer. So I'm a senior audio producer at a company called Spirit Studios, uh, which work across um, podcasts as well as TV. Um, I started my career in the Roundhouse, so there was a lot of opportunities to meet amazing creatives, a lot of young, inspirational individuals, um, and really just a massive playground to discover what it is that you loved about life, but more importantly, yourself. Um, and my career journey is a bit ziggity-zaggity, but I'll link all of those loops and it will start making sense um, about the importance of a side hustle and the importance of discovery. So in the best of way, this is Janelle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Janelle, and I uh, am all things music, basically. Uh, I started uh, when I left university doing sociology. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but um, I think my professional journey has been very much trial and error, and linked to this quote, I think there's definitely beauty in making mistakes and falling forwards, I guess. Um, so yeah, I've, I, I basically wore quite a few hats. Once I left uni, I started DJing. I taught myself how to DJ. Um, I also was doing radio for a little while. And um, I then went on to work for a music distribution company, which is what I'm doing at the moment. So I'm fully immersed in music now, but 
it was definitely a struggle. And uh, I'm also doing my master's at Westminster um, part-time, so there is also that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a journey. I'm, I'm 30 now, and I can say it's only probably in the past year that I feel like I've started to <laughs> get things together. So, but yeah, I'll talk about that more later. <laughs> Cool. So first question is then, what motivates you? What's the world for if you can't make it up the way you want it? Toni Morrison. Um, I guess I'll just kick it off. Yeah, what motivates you? Um, I think joy. Joy is always the brand. Um, joy is a great brand because it just allows you to refocus on what makes you happy. Um, so uh, alongside radio, I founded a platform called Too Much Source. And Too Much Source exists and is dedicated to celebrating young black British creatives who are making history today. Because when we talk about history and we talk about black history, often it's a very American narrative. And we love the American narrative, but there's actually people here in my lifetime that are doing sick things. And it just came about because, and we talk about side hustling, because it was just empty. I couldn't see anyone who looked like me, my mum, my dad, all, people who I just thought, where are you? You're doing amazing things, but we can't see it. And so I took my 300 pounds in my bank account and hired out a place in Carnaby Street and just put on a full exhibition of about 50 people, black people that I love, friends, colleagues, family members, and people throughout the week would come, bring their grandkids in half term and all the rest of it, and then just had open mic sessions of people just sharing about their journeys and people would connect and network and it grew and grew and so Buggles Grace last year did it with the Barbican you know when you have an idea and it's actually nothing and it grows legs and five years later the Barbican are like yeah we got budget like we got budget I'm like how much budget they said yeah we got budget we want to put on a big exhibition we took over the floor of Barbican Centre linked it up with one extra had four panels had crazy people come through and just celebrate and we were really black in the Barbican like blackity black 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 in the Barbican and so it was amazing to just see an idea that you just thought oh this is cool because me and my friends are doing it until someone buys in and you're like wow this can be something that is existing outside of me because it was a 30 day exhibition and I wasn't there for some of those days but it existed so I think yeah what motivates me is affirming people celebrating people finding the joy in people because life is tough like life is really really tough and so to give someone an outlet to say what's your story how can we celebrate you how can we champion you it always comes back around and so yeah too much sauce is one of my really proud side hustles that's slightly becoming a bit of a job i'm like oh my gosh employ me then employ me so yeah definitely taking something an idea and seeing it through five years has been a real joy um which comes back around so yeah that's what motivates me wow big motivations i love it um, in terms of what motivates me, I would say discovery. And I kind of alluded it to it earlier when I was talking about discovery of the world, but more importantly, discovery of yourself. And to me, there was always a quote like, people can only meet you as far as you've met yourself. And I studied psychology and undergrad, and I was always interested in how people made sense of the world, how I made sense of the world. And then you could see based on someone's experiences, how they interacted with you. And it was just something really intriguing about like just meeting different people and like I could kind of paint this picture about where I thought they'd came from. Either they would affirm it or they would throw it to the wind. So off the back of that, like I'd always had this interest in like interviewing these amazing creatives and finding out a little bit, take them away from the world of like, tell me about your show, tell me about something that you're promoing and asking them a little bit more of a deeper question about what does a peace of mind mean to you? How do you frame the world? Where do you find solace? Things like that to me were the real interesting things and the basis of how I formed a lot of my friendships in general. And then you get to a stage where, you know, you just kind of only want to be around people who are able to identify that in themselves and in, and in you. And, you know, that journey of growth is ongoing. Um, so, yeah, that was something that I wanted to discover and I wanted to create alongside a full-time job. Um, just to, more so from a selfish and personal reason, going out there and just seeing what the world had to offer. So if we're talking about what motivates you, it's the constant discovery of who I am, of the world, and yeah, just finding out where we could best be placed in the nicest way. So I would say what motivates me is my passion. Um, it's definitely got me through some really hard times. <laughs> uh, it's not been easy working in the industry and especially being a black woman in music as well. The representation isn't 
as high. Uh, so that is something that I'm constantly thinking of in the back of my mind that, you know, as, as hard as it gets, it, it's the driving force. It's why I went back to school to do a master's. Um, and it's why I'm, I'm really striving to, to do the best that I can and, and get a, a senior role in music. But um, yeah, I've always, I've always believed that you should do something that you're passionate in um, and the money will follow. So don't necessarily um, chase the money. Uh, but yeah, I would say passion is definitely my number one for me. Love it. Um, yeah, we're cool. Um, what has been your professional journey? I had to make my own living and my own opportunity, but I made it. Don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. Um, what has been your professional journey? So I'm freelance, and I think there's, there's often not a lot of chat. My mum's in HR. My dad's a chef. They go to work. They come home. They're not doing 10 million jobs. My mum's like... Why have you got 10 jobs to do? What, aren't you going to sit down? I'm like, no, like, that's not the way we do things. I'm, you freelance, you side hustle. So um, professional journey-wise, to be honest with you, I didn't know about freelancing until I took a job in radio and they wouldn't pay me because I wasn't set up as not a PAYE person. And they were like, you need to be a, a limited company. And I was like, huh? <laughs> I didn't take that GCSE, bro. I don't understand what you're talking about. They're like, no, you need to set yourself up as a limited company, da 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 da, da. And I was like, oh, right. And then you start talking about, you know, for the tax man, VAT and blah, 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 blah. And so professionally, money-wise, I didn't really know how that worked because no one taught me. And so it was only until I wasn't getting paid, I then had a really great accountant. Shouts goes out to Yemi. Oh, my gosh, Yemi. You know me. I don't do numbers. Yemi, you look after me. So just getting a professional accountant and all of those things. But then juggling your week. Some weeks look intense and they're like... You know, Zara will say, right, put the date in the diary. you got to know. And you know what? I thought this event was last week, you know. Imagine I was coming up last week like, Zara, I'm literally, she's like, why? It's next week. And so sometimes as a freelance, you're just, yeah, you're in control of your diary, in control of your time, and that can be great. But I'd say the downside of that is routine. You often don't have something that grounds you. So I thank God for my job at One Extra because I know every Saturday morning, I know where I'm going to be for the next three hours, and that keeps me grounded to do all the other fun stuff around it. Um, but I would say as a freelancer, someone who, you know, is just get up and go, um, there's not much of a blueprint for that. And so you are relying on other people who do that and, and other jobs that are similar to yours to rely on, on how to know what to do. And sometimes just taking the stick that someone will say, when are you going to get a real job? And you're like, I've been doing this job for bare time. It is my real job. And they're like, yeah, but where's your office? Who's your office party crew? It's like those things that are traditional in its job routine ways. Sometimes as a freelance, sometimes as an individual, they don't look like that. But loads of things don't look traditional, right? So, um, yeah, professionally, there are definitely building blocks to being professional. But I'd say I've learned some of the things in an easy way and in a hard way of what as a freelance just just doesn't look traditional. Um, but I give thanks for this generation that it is becoming a little bit more um, it, it, the norm, you know, the norm. And you could, uh, these do all the time. What do you do about this? How do you discuss your rate? Da, 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 da. And so if you've got good people around you to have that conversation with, you don't feel isolated. You feel very much in community with people who are doing the similar thing. So, yeah, look, big question, but what about yourself? Yeah, very, very big question. Um, so what has been my professional journey to date? Um, so kind of working in traditional spaces. So actually one of the spaces that we all met was at a, a place called Go Think Big, which was all around like giving young people opportunities and funding to start their career in like a creative an avenue of some form. And I was like a project coordinator. So I used to be able to give them like up to 500 pounds to be like, go change the world. And you knew 500 pounds wouldn't get you that far, but it was like, you know what? But yeah, plant the seed and then life will kind of like water it. Um, and then kind of in that whole space, I knew I wasn't trying to be fulfilled by necessarily the job that I was doing. So I was having an amazing time at Go Think Big and I was very fortunate amongst that. I was helping amazing young people. I was working with amazing people. But the whole idea of having a side hustle actually came out of the idea of like, you need to find whatever it is that motivates you and that you can find solace in. So I would go into work, I'd be amazing, I'd have a great time there, but then I could also go to the roundhouse and experiment and do all of the things that I wanted to do, which meant that I had a clear distinction between the two. So as maybe what usually happens is your side hustle either starts watering, it starts growing, starts developing, and then it's quite clear that either you might need to make a transition. 
Um, and yeah, it just, just overall, I kept moving. After Go Think Big, I ended up working for a big music company called Mixcloud, well, radio DJ, um, for those people who know about uploading audio. But what was quite fortunate was I was still growing the network in the, the podcast production and like just creating like outside of work. So it meant that by the time I'd left Mixcloud, I actually left to go to an internship. And I remember being like, this is a terrible decision, but I don't know if I would ever be given another opportunity to get into the, into the career or into the audio world that I wanted to. And fortunately, all of the years that I'd worked or been working at the Roundhouse, playing around, had held me in good stead, which meant that when I jumped in this internship, not knowing what the future would hold, they just told me it was two months long and that no one really gets jobs in radio and in audio. And I was like, well, let's just, let's just give it a stab in the dark. Super fortunate I could live at my mum's. Super fortunate I had so many other things around me. Have to be very clear about that. But what that allowed me to do was had a clear distinction and a clear goal in my mind of like what it is that I wanted to do and where I wanted to go to. So yeah, really fortunately, two and a half years later, like it's flourished and I've been working across like shows for like Spotify, so work at One Extra, producing shows, um, also working across like BBC, Slates, and yeah, the, my side hustle ultimately became my career. And in an ideal world, that would have been the dream, but I never relied on that being the only dream. So, uh, yeah, following on from Ray, I guess I could also agree that my side hustle was, uh, yeah, it was, I don't want to say pipe dream, but it was definitely something that I had passion in, but it didn't seem feasible for me to do it full time. So when I left uni, I, I wanted to work in music, but I hadn't seen anyone like me in the scene at the time, and I didn't know where to go. So I basically started doing my own thing, um, started a podcast with my friend, got that then led into me doing a radio show at Radar uh, for about a year, I think, and um, it, it then led, the radio then led to me DJing, and basically I was, I was DJing alongside working, but it was all very, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't planned, pretty much. I, I was just going with the flow and just seeing where it landed, and I think uh, that links to what I was saying before about just going for it, just trying things, not being as afraid of failing. Um, not all the stuff that I did worked. I definitely um, look back and cringe at some of the things that I did, but that's fine. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess what I'm doing now, sorry, I'm an artist relations manager for Believe, um, and I got that off the back of my DJing as well. So even though I'm not DJing as much because I'm doing my masters and working, and it is a lot, it definitely, open the door for me to then get my first full-time job in music. So nothing is without reason. And just to jump on, I know we're going to jump on real quick, but just to say as well, like there's so many things that we do, don't we, that you just think, I just got to pay the bills. Like it's all well and good saying, I'm just going to go and chase this dream. When I, when I joined Kiss, they just weren't, sorry, I know it's filmed. When I joined the radio station, I just weren't getting like, the money I was trying to make. So I went into teaching and I tutored English and that's the only subject I can teach. But the little boy, the family, I started teaching the Sri Lankan family in their house and then through pandemic on Zoom. And now he's about to go and take his GCSEs and I'm crying, I'm like, oh my gosh. But that was paying me like 20 pounds an hour. And I was just doing like maybe three classes three days a week. And that was making me enough money to just put money on my oyster to go into the next gig and do all of those things because you just got to find ways to connect your side hustles and sometimes it doesn't look glamorous it doesn't look pretty but it's rewarding whatever it is so I just don't want to paint this dream of like oh side hustle da, 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 da. and it doesn't always come with um the gloss and the glam of it there is real sacrifice and late nights and stuff that you think you look back and you cringe you're like oh I just had to do that man like <laughs> so yeah just wanting to be very frank about those things was, about that as well I was gonna say just to add quickly when you just spark something in my brain sometimes the belief that like a full-time job equals security yeah. is also like a misconception yeah. and that uh, the company always has your best interest well they do at the time but as you can see post-covid and any anything that can go on in an external world would just mean that things that you thought were stable could become destabilized so the idea of like a side hustle or a side gig is more about security and like safeguarding your own, your own beliefs and your own interests and your own needs um, in a world that can be so uncertain. So if you're going into a full time just being like, this is the guarantee that life will always be rosy, 
to me, I'd always had in the back of my mind, life can be rocky no matter what path you take. So just to give myself a, the double the chance of a security or double the chance of a new skill set, a freelance or a side hustle can actually open you up to different possibilities. So that was just what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, what have you learned about the world? Oh, Tony Morrison. The very serious function of racism, oh, preach, is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you from explaining over and over again your reason for being. Um, yeah, do you know what? Just as reading this quote and a story that I told Zara, I was like, oh, I don't know what to share, but let me just share. Um, I went on a tour, uh, before, or just after the pandemic, but before the pandemic as well, called uh, BBC Share Your Story. And so from the BBC, you'd go into schools, yeah, predominantly schools, and share different stories about different jobs. And I went to Blackpool one time, yeah. This is no shade to the beef, no shade to no one. I just went to Blackpool, rock up to Blackpool on a Sunday night, nine o'clock, get off the train, and I'm like, yo, Blackpool, I don't know one in, I don't know Blackpool like that. My phone is nearly dying, there's no Uber. I was like, what do you mean there's no Uber in Blackpool? What's going on? So I called the Blackpool cab office, and they're like, yeah, cool, your cab will be here in 10 minutes' time. Cool, Sunday night, dark, trying to get to this hotel. I don't know Blackpool, and it's raining. I get to the, the steps now, and there's four white guys standing in front of me. So I joined the queue, and this cab pulls up, and every one of them goes up, goes up, goes up, and it's like, are you here for so-and-so, are you here? And he says, no. So I thought, rah, this cab is Blackpool Cab, ah, you're quick. I got to Blackpool Cab now, and he was like, oh, are you here for Fran? That's actually my full name. Well, Francoise is my full name, but I said Fran rather than Swazi because Blackpool probably couldn't handle Swazi. Anyway, go to the cabman, and he's like, yeah, I'm here for Fran. Cool. By the way, I just had my edges laid. I had my braids in. It was my birthday that week, whatever. I got to the man. I open up his boot, and I put my um, suitcase in, and he runs around the back of this cab, you know. He goes, whoa, 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 what do you think you're doing? I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm going to the hotel you just booked me for. He goes, I don't take people like you. I said, Sorry? He goes, I don't take people like you. Get your stuff out of my cab right now and book yourself another cab. I was so shocked. You see this quote here, yeah? It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. In that moment, best believe I had every Toni Morrison quote, every Alice Walker quote, da 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 da, da. And in that moment, I just crumbled, man. Like, I didn't know what to say. I felt so vulnerable. I didn't know what I would... And there's four guys behind me, you know, not one of these men them want to come up to me and say, yo, you can't say that, da da da, da. Anyway, the cab goes now, and I'm like, I'm stuck. I'm genuinely stuck. Who's going to come and save me? My mum is in London. Like, I'm in Blackpool. What's... Anyway, Hercules behind me, some tall white guy. The next cab comes through and he knocks on the window and he goes, listen, mate, I'm going to the same hotel she's going to. I don't want to hear nothing. Get in the cab. And I was like, thank you, Bruce. I'm like, thank you, Hercules. But now I feel like I don't know what to do. Do I get in the cab with this random white guy? Do I not get in the cab? I'm stuck. And you just take your bets. And I say that to say, by God's grace alone, this lovely guy got in the cab with me, took me to the hotel, paid for the cab, and I just got in and I got to the BBC. And then tomorrow, do you know what I had to do? Pretend like it didn't happen. Pretend like it didn't happen. I told the guys I was working with, thankfully they believed me. A couple guys were like, no, he didn't mean it like that. What did he mean then? And this thing, it keeps you explaining. Even when you do explain, you don't feel heard, you don't feel listened to. So all you do, you suppress, you suppress, you suppress, and you turn up to work, and you just let it go. You just let it go. You hold on to it. And so I think like the idea of racism is, is not some backyard thing that happened 40, 50, 60. It's happening today, and there's people like us that just have to crack on and do stuff. And it's like, I actually want to explain this to you, but you're not listening. And so when you find the Raymonds and Janelles and Zara, and you say it to people, and they just say, yeah, like, it's terrible, isn't it? Even that piece of being heard in your day-to-day -day job of having to rock up, it's just the solitude and, and the, the, oh, the feeling seen that you go back into work and you can be your best self. So I just wanted to say that. Otherwise, I think, yeah, you, you fly around these things and you hear, oh, you did this and you did this job, and it sounds amazing. It does. It is amazing. But it is a lot of work, and it's a lot of suppressing at the same time that you've got to go through. Um, and yeah, racism is, is very, very real. Wow. So yeah. Oh no, let us not be clapping, oh no. <laughs> no, joking, thank you, thank you. Um, powerful, nice. Um, one thing I've like kind of learned about the world is that we could have the same stimuli, but we've all got different emotions and feelings attached to that. 
And that to me, like, if we're looking at theory of mind, so the idea that we all have a very different perspective on how we see the world or understanding that other people view the world differently to yourself means that sometimes your experience up until that point might not be validated by another human being. So when you, end, when you actually end up like steering towards places like Side Hustle, it's so you can build communities around people who understand the thing that you think you're all understanding at the same time with the same experience. Whereas you're not always fortunate enough to be in a building, whether that's an institution, and be like, cool, this person just knows about everything that I've gone through, hence the reason that I'm potentially acting in this way, hence the reason why I might not be pronunciating in a way that feels very comfortable or makes him or her feel as though I am someone that they should trust. There are so many things that have like altered my experience to that point, as, as, as has theirs. So I think one thing you realize is, again, everyone views the world very differently and what you can do as a result of that is you can find tribes, you can find communities, and you can find and build things around that, um, which feel like a natural reprise and a space away from some institutions which feel immovable. So that's one thing I've learned. So as a uh, black woman, I've heard growing up a lot that you have to work twice as hard for half as much. And that, I can't even explain what that does to the psyche. I think it has really been the driving force for my work ethic and why I continue to just do as much as I do, but it also, is, it's, not, it's not fun, it's, it's tiring. And this is what you're saying, this is like, there's no, you can't glamorize that. Um, and yeah, that's just something to know. But um, you know, when you have scholarships like the Rich, Richard Antwee Scholarship, which I'm on, it's things like that that really open the doors for people like me. And um, I think it's very important to note that there are organizations out there and opportunities out there to, to go and grab. And um, I think I've just always been for that. Um, I'm, I, I really try to go against the grain and work with what I've got. Um, and as hard as it is, it's just, you just have to keep going. Um, and I don't want it to sound negative. But I think, if anything, this is just, this is really positive. This talk is positive as well. And just, yeah, just um, knowing that you can do what you are destined to do, but it comes with hard work. Absolutely. Um... Oh, what have you learned about yourself? The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Alice Walker. Oh, I love Alice Walker. What have I learned about myself? Um, I've learned... Uh, quick stars. Okay, I think I've learned that people just think I look 12 like, and, and just feel like you can just flick her and she don't know nothing and whatever. And my nan is the best person. She's like, just think that they think you're stupid. Yeah, let them think that. Let them think you're stupid. Let them think you're stupid and run on and do your thing. So when you do whatever you're doing and you bad it up, these are like, oh, snap. So for prime time example, um, George Floyd, 2020, took us all out, in radio in particular, conversations on black culture, black music, black this, blah, 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 and we ain't got language for it, shook everything, shook everything. And so I went into one meeting at one radio station and was like, I don't want to do the job of people who are at the top, um, white men who are at the top and don't have language when they're running black culture around here. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And so everyone was like, what? The 12 year old's got something to say. I said, every time, Smash, you wanna do this? You wanna do, yeah, 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 yeah. But at this point I said, no, the power lies with me here. Cause you want me to tell stories of my own racism or my own this and my own that. But for what gain? Is it just for another reel, another TikTok, another this, whatever? And so you know what I did? And everyone's got their own uh, opinions on this. I went into reverse mentoring with my top, 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 top boss. Like my boss is boss, boss, boss. And obviously the coins went there. But I'm a believer in grace. I'm a believer in the MLK that you extend grace in order that your heart would change, your priorities would change, and there would be an inward work of that. And you know what? I was just one presenter, you know. I'm now changing the way we do recruitment, the way we do this 
D and I, da, 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 and the impact that I had before I left was amazing. Not me, not me, not me, but just the conversations that I was able to have at the top. When I see this, what have I learned about myself? I know stuff. Like, my experience is valid. When I tell you, don't do this, do it like this, and it works, I know it works. Like, I don't have your job and I ain't got your pay grade, but I know this will work, bro. Believe me and do it. And so when things start to change and things around you start to change, you're like, wow, that's empowering. That question about how do you feel about power, when you know you've got it and you can see it being used, it's a beautiful feeling, man. It empowers you and gives you so much confidence. So, yeah, conversations that I wasn't having pre-pandemic like pandemic and all of that, when things sparked it and I lent into that rather than thinking, oh, what will they think? Or why, why am I here at the table? No, you're here for a reason, Swad. You've got stuff to say. Um, yeah, that felt really, really empowering. So, yeah, what have I learned about myself? Keep letting them think you're stupid and that you're 12 years old because when you bad up the conversation, yeah, they're going to start listening. So. <laughs> Mad. Um, just kind of what you were saying about power, like what I've learned about myself is the ability to create is like endless. And by that, I don't mean like by a means to an end, like not for like the validation, validation or the applause of the masses. Like you should just be creating for the sake of creating. You've got the hands, you've got the, you've got the feet in, in, by grace in, in some instances. You should just be out here experimenting and discovering what it is and what it is that you could enjoy. Um, and I think as soon as you take away expectation from all of that, you start creating with a different energy. And when you can actually harness what that energy is and you can move that into any other part of your life, you, you, you flourish. Like, it's, it's unreal. Sometimes it's like when I feel nervous or when I'm about to enter a meeting, I kind of sit with myself and I kind of try and find this, like, it's hard to explain and seems well woo woo. But you have to, I like, if you're me, you might get it. But you sit, you find this space. And then it's that place of like anything is it's boundless love, like boundless opportunity and boundless like experience and just being like, go from there. Instead of going into this place thinking like, I need to be perfect, I need to be this person's, I need to be ticking this person's box. It's like, no, move from this place of love and move from this place of curiosity. So I think whenever I apply that to anything, I always find that like the, the results are always magical and beyond what I could have expected. So yeah. yeah. Oh! So I would say I'm definitely still learning about myself like every day, as we all are, I'm sure. But um, what I've learned about myself so far is that I'm unique and I do have something to offer. Um, I think it's very easy to get bogged down in the day to day and this constant rat race, hamster wheel, whatever you want to call it, you know, just always being on the grind, always hustling. But um, yeah, and that can, that can, I guess, create self doubt and make you wonder, why am I even doing this? Should I be doing this? I don't know. Should I, be? I mean, I, I doubt myself a lot, um, and that's something I am working on. However, I've come to the realization that I do have something to offer the world, <laughs> and um, I'm here. I'm here to stay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What advice would you give to black students starting their careers? The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Um, yeah, Alice Walker, what advice would you give to black students Starting their careers. Um, whew, um, I, I think I, sorry, I should have just said, always linking it back to side hustling, side hustling. You know, the, the, the power that you gain or the, the feeling that your voice is powerful in those settings, it, it just spills into whatever side hustle you're doing, whatever career you're doing, because it's actually about your confidence and how, how confident you are in yourself to say, I'm going to make this decision and I'm going to feel a peace about this decision, even if it goes upside down like in this moment in this snapshot I believed in this so I think I should say I went to university I studied publishing I thought I'd be an editor I got into Penguin I thought I'd made it I was like yeah cool and when I got there I was like this is so dry like this is so dry like I just didn't enjoy it and I just thought oh my gosh I've spent three years studying English and creative writing I thought I'd be a publisher editor da, da, da. and then I won this competition to be a basketball presenter because obviously I'm six foot one and so now I'm going to like France and doing all these things and I was just like you know what Swaz it doesn't matter all the skills that you've picked up along the way they will mesh they will mold they will they will come with you so uh, my, my advice would be don't be afraid to change you can change your career at any time you can change your job at any time you can change the people you're working with at any time you can change your hours at any time like 
that that shouldn't limit you. It should excite you. Like, you know, I t- today I went for a podcast and I had to walk for a graveyard. Sorry, very, very sad. But like, walk for a graveyard. And I was just like, you know what's not on tombstones? Your TikTok following. Your money. Nothing. It says so-and-so is the wife of so-and-so and this is the day she died. That's legit. And I just thought, Swaz, live for now. Like, do, pour it all. Do it all. Do it all. Because we will die. Like, we don't take this stuff with us, you know what I mean? Max it out, draw it out, squeeze it out. So if you want to go for that job and you're thinking, oh, so-and-so, forget so-and-so, go and do it, go and do it, go and do it. I think I've changed my job so many times and hearing how other people have changed their job and brought the same skills, it makes me feel like, yeah, I can, I can do it. It's scary, but you will not, you know, you'll get there to the other side. So, yeah, start your career, change it along the way. It ain't that deep, man. Yeah. No, I do, yeah. No, I agree, I agree. And um, the idea that like fear, um, your, your actual life starts at the end of beyond your barriers. Yeah. Um, so fear and failure will have you stuck in a lot of weird positions in places you don't feel comfortable with people you don't feel comfortable around in some terrible jobs where you don't feel nurtured, but fear will have you staying there. Familiarity will have you staying there. Sometimes taking a leap of faith, not necessarily like, I know financial, financial like difficulties can stop people from maneuvering as they wish. But in some instances, there's always opportunities to kind of lean into your left a bit, finding different places that you realize that you're scared to look beyond. Like really, you're living on a wing and a prayer and like you didn't come this far to only come this far. So like always know that there's a possibility, there is a new day, there's a new sunrise, there's a new opportunity. So yeah, if you find yourself debilitated by the people and things you're around, there's always a new dawn to, to, to find a new way out. Yeah, I don't know if I can add much to what you guys have just said because that's basically it. I mean, yeah, feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, that, that should really be the motto of life. Just go for it. Um, get out of your comfort zone. Not a lot happens there. And keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? So brilliant. Um, so has anyone got any questions? We're going to come to the audience for some Q&A. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that. I really, really enjoyed that talk, and thanks for coming into the university. The wife, I think. Cool. Um, so, I, I was wondering during that talk is side hustling, being so busy on the go all the time. How do you kind of combine that with self care and giving yourself enough time to kind of just pause sometimes and reflect on things? Um, you know, my thing last year, yeah, was, was, so I went to the Barbican and the, the theme was rest and ironically asked me if I rested putting on this exhibition, zero rest. But what I did was I went to Centre Parks with my family the week before and took a week out. And then a week after I finished the exhibition, I took a week out. And I just find that top and tailing big projects with a week of rest and a week after, it just, you feel rejuvenated to go into the busy season and then you've got something to look forward to when it gets stressy in the middle of the season as well so yeah rest and and I think silencing voices that are like I'm so busy and busy being a badge of honor like actually it's not come and kill yourself every day like find things that you want to do and even sorry that was one thing but also I, I host with friends every second Sunday of the month a goal setting so we go for dinner and we set like eight goals of eight different categories and you're meant to choose one goal meant to choose one goal to focus on each month so you stick a date in the diary because I just find if you are not intentional about your rest your weeks will fill up your months will fill, before you know it's your birthday again and you're like oh <laughs> how am I here so yeah a week before and after projects and a date in the diary with friends that does not move whether or not whoever can make it I find is a really good way of being intentional. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, there was the quote, like, rest is a form of resistance. Um, and the idea, like, yeah, obviously you have to take that into consideration that there's, there's a, a period of time that you should be resting. Um, I kind of see life as, like, seasonal. Sometimes you sow, sometimes you reap. Um, so in order to be most productive and to be your 110, so you could give your goals everything, you need to prioritize rest. Um, and know that hard work as well comes and then there's a ser- period where six weeks you might be back to back but it's always about listening to your body and listening to your frame of mind if you feel for some reason you need to be able to communicate with the people around you and be very open and honest about where you currently are without communication we're expecting people to understand or read our situation which is lunacy 
Um, so yeah, just open dialogue and also just making sure that, yeah, you prioritize rest as resistance. Yeah, so I remember I used to feel bad about napping, which is crazy, or just lying in bed and doing absolutely nothing. I think you just have to, um, yeah, just, just be open to not doing anything and feeling okay about it. I, I make time for myself. I just spend time by, yeah, by myself. Um, I'm quite introverted anyway, but it's just a case of doing things you enjoy that doesn't involve work or your side hustle, um, whatever that is for you. For me, I like going to the theater by myself. That's my thing. Reading to, um, it's just, yeah, carving out time for yourself that doesn't involve the hustle. And just quickly to add to that as well, don't make your rest your side hustle. Like, it's so easy to do the thing that you love and then monetize it. And it's like, no, just read and don't put a blog post to it. Just do it and right. be done. So I feel like I'm guilty of that monetizing my hobbies because I'm like, I love this. I could do this. It's like, no, Swans, just eat the pizza and go home. Do you know what I mean? Like, just be done with it. So, yeah, absolutely. Do things you enjoy. Thank you so much. That was a really great question. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, any other questions for our panel? Um, I'm going to come to the back, I'm going to come to Wale first, and then Edna, and then, was it you, Victoria? Thank you. Uh, thank you um, to, to the speakers. Um, I've really enjoyed and I've learned a lot from what, from what, what you've said so far. But I just wanted to ask, um, when everything is not going as planned, when everything is shattering, you know, you know there's, there's no hope, there's nothing that's going to, there's nothing good coming up. Um, how do you, um, how do you um, encourage yourself to get up mm. and either continue or just start again? Mm. Thanks, Ollie. For me, it's just about positive affirmations. So speaking that to yourself, it, it's quite powerful. Um, just, it's hard because, yeah, life can be hard and words don't solve everything, but if you are affirming yourself that it is okay to not be okay and to keep going regardless and not be f fearful of failure, I think that's a big plus. Um, and yeah, just yeah, just being okay with not being okay, I think that's the main thing. Um, and sitting in that and being comfortable and sitting in that and then moving on. You know, there's always tomorrow. Keep going. <laughs> Um, just, just that is that is super valid, and I think sometimes your world and your side hustles they they crash, and then it just feels like there's absolutely no one to turn to. And I actually find that it only is in hindsight. And again, I'm not telling you like everything's going to be okay, but it's only in, in in hindsight when I can reflect and I can start seeing what's actually developed out of all of the ashes. Like there is an element of resilience. There's an element of like um, hardiness. There's an element of a deeper understanding of myself and my vulnerabilities and my weaknesses and the things that I was embarrassed by for it shattering and, and the things that I didn't want the world or myself to know. They're all very valid, but it's only like real insight into yourself and into those around you. And I think that to me is the invaluable parts. And no one's saying those periods that you're going through turmoil should be easy. Yes, you're meant to sit in it. Yes, they're uncomfortable. Yes, they can feel like they're endless. But usually when you come out of the other end and you can look back with a bit of time, you actually are not thankful, but you realize why it needed to happen for you to be able to endure the next chapter of your life. Yeah, everything that these guys said, I guess, I keep dropping, what is on me? I don't know what is dropping. Um, I feel like just, do you know what, my faith, uh, to be straight up with you, when I became a Christian, I got caught shoplifting at 14 years old, you know, and I was good at it. So when the boss man caught me, I said, huh, how have you caught me? I'm so good at this. And in that moment, I just said, oh my gosh, he's on the phone to the police. If my mum catches me in a police car, it's curtains, bro. It's done. It is jail already. So I just said, God, if you're real, get me out of the situation. I'll never shoplift and I'll follow you. And as soon as I said amen, the guy just put the phone down to the police. And I was like, maybe there is a God. Like, what's going on? And that's when I, yeah, honestly, I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the guy just let me go. But I found that when I went to that youth group and I found all those skills and whatever, what I actually found was a real, um, like, an assurance that if the world ends tomorrow, like, God really does love me. Like, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross, rise three days later. When I look at all these paintings and I think of history and whatever, like, the things that people have gone through, I'm just a dot in, in, in this grand scheme of life. And I think that there, some things really happened in the last couple of years that shook my world. But when I look back at that moment when God just grabbed me out of it, I'm like, okay, if this project doesn't go to pot, 
it's not going to be on my tombstone. Do you know what I mean? Like, I need to have heaven in the context of it all because sickness comes and a pandemic comes and death comes. And those things, you can't side hustle your way out of. I need to know God loves me and he cares for me and he, he is for me. So when it all goes to pot, like my faith and, G, like, sorry, real quick, there's a guy called Simon in the Bible, yeah, and Simon was a fisherman doing his own thing. Jesus comes and gets him. He's like, come follow me. Simon comes follow Jesus. A couple chapters later, Jesus dies. He's bare disappointed. He's like, fam, I've been following you and now you're dead. Like, where are you at? And then he comes back to Peter. Peter's like, I'm going to go fish again. And he dropped everything and went back to his old way of life. Sometimes I feel like that. I feel like, God, you've disappointed me. This project's disappointed. I'm going to go back. And God just goes back and comes and gets me again. And I feel, God, it's just such a good God to come and pluck me out of whatever disappointment, whatever failure I've had to just remind me. It's not the sum total of your life, was. It's not what you're living for. Like, don't worry about those things. So, yeah, I think when all loses hope, my faith and just that keeps me filled again and again and again. Because it's true. Life happens. And that's a great question to just, yeah, pinpoint what does matter in life. So, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much, panel. Um, Edna. Edna, did you have a question? You've answered it perfectly. No, How much was the yeah. Thank you, Edna. Um, Victoria, we've got Victoria, and then we'll go to Debs. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for this, and you're all very, very inspiring and brilliant speakers, by the way. Um, I just wanted to know how you made that career switch because I remember you were doing English literature, you turned to radio, you were doing psychology, and you turned to podcasting, you were doing sociology, if I'm not mistaken, turned to DJ. So they're very drastic, different career paths. So how did you make that change? Good question, very good question. Yeah, um, so the actual moment where it really changed for me, like I said, I was working at a company, I won't say who, but um, I was just not enjoying the job at all. Like I was, I, I loved my colleagues. I, I actually thought the title of the job it's one of those, you know, sometimes you work in a place and you tell someone you work somewhere, they're like, oh, what, you work at? Da, 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 da. And then there's only so long you can ride on that, I'll be honest, because you, you, reality hits and it's like, am I just living to keep everyone else like, oh my God, you're the guy who works at? Da, 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 da. So I was like, you know what? Like, I, I remember I used to ring Janelle sometimes on my lunch. I'll be like, I've tried to come in early because I'm not the one that blames the world straight away. It's like, what can I do? to adapt, to get better. Do I need to come in early? Do I need to stay later? Do I need to learn more? Those are all the things that I was like, cool, over the course of six, seven months. Like, let's just keep doing that. It weren't working and I just had this nightmare boss and I would ring Janelle sometimes. I'll be like, I need to quit. Like I'm actually, but I've never felt those overly an anxious feelings, but I'd come in the morning, I'd have a meeting with one of the people who I disliked at the time. And he would just fill me with this fear and dread. And I was like, I just can't keep doing this. I actually can't. And for the first time in my life, I actually left the job without securing another. And again, super fortunate. I had my family home. There were so many reasons why I could have done that. But if any, anything, it was all the reasons why I should have done that. Because I was in this space around supportive people. And I was like, you know what? Like, I know the intention's pure. And I'm going to find something. I'm going to land on my feet. And then I didn't land on my feet. And then months went by, no job. And I was getting broke. Like, broke, broke, broke. It weren't a good look. Um, it was bad. And then I saw this internship, and had I have been in a full-time job, I would have never left to go do an internship. And I was, at the time, 27, 28. I was like, wow, I'm going to do an internship. In my mind, felt like something that you would have done prior to uni. Maybe I didn't even need to go to uni to do. And, you know, I just thought, like, what's going to happen? They're telling me there's no money in it. Two months, you can't be guaranteed a job. And literally, my world changed. And the connections and the networks I made. And I was in a place through life where I was so much more open to receiving. I'd gone through experiences. I've, I've, I'd sharpened my email, my, all of the stuff that I would have done in a corporate job. I sharpened that. So when it came to something I really wanted to do creatively, which the things that I'd learned weren't a necessity, I was still able to bring that into it. So not only am I still like showcasing the, the skill sets from a corporate, but I've also got this creative flair and excitement about like learning and this curiosity. And there was this whole humbling process where I was like, look, every day is a school day. Like, I'm not beyond an internship. I'm not beyond um, starting again. I'm not above anyone here who might be younger or, or older. Like, humble yourself, get your backpack, and start your school day. And then, yeah, that's kind of how the situation unfolded.
Um, yeah, you, you're, never, you're never above anything. I feel like I, I loved English as a kid in school, was never good at maths, never good at science. I just knew I was going to go into English. But to be honest, when I'm in radio, you have to write a lot. You do have to write a lot of scripts, and I love editing. And, and people will send me their dissertations, and please, not for any, I'm not that good to be doing it here in this university. Please don't hold me. But like people are oh, here's my CV. Can you look it? And I enjoy putting the commas in, and I'm that geeky person that would love to do that. So... I enjoy that, and it's not that because I'm not working at Penguin anymore. I feel it's a waste of time. When I go into radio, we have to script things for interviews. When I was at the basketball job, it was like, okay, b b lots of sports people, athletes, are not media trained, so having to ask the right question, having to draw it out of them. So those things I learned from youth group and all. So I'm just saying it comes full circle, but those jobs, you just have to take the leap. I can't explain, it's just a leap of faith. And maybe it's good friends and good family to encourage you that you won't land on your face. And even if you do, they'll pick you up. So I, I, genuinely, everyone changes at some point. Don't feel any type of way, like, do it. Because if, you, if, you, if you're wanting to go in, do it anyway, y you will drive yourself to make sure that it works out. And when it does work out, you're like, you'll sit there six months later, you're like, right, what was I worried about? And then the next one will come along. So always take a notebook and jot down the things you were fearful of and how it's moved to a thank you list. Um, gratitude is always a great way when you feel stressed and nervous about things as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say the catalyst of change for me was just not being fulfilled in what I was doing and just being hungry for more. I just couldn't see myself doing what I was doing for, for I don't know, how many years. And I was just like, I need, I need more. I need, I need something to uh, satisfy me. And that's when the journey started. But it, it wasn't easy. It was a lot of trial and error and just trying different things and seeing if it worked. Um, and not everything did work. But yeah, I think for me, I just, I just knew where I wanted to go. And I just knew that there, there had to be a certain trajectory towards that but I didn't know what it was so it was just trying multiple things and I think that's been the theme in our talks just going for it just trying different things not limiting yourself to one specific thing and just seeing what works seeing what sticks I think that's <laughs> what happens a lot of the time in life you just see what sticks and uh, hope for the best <laughs> but uh, with hard work I think it can it can really take off and um yeah, that's part of the reason why I decided to come back to uni and do a master's uh, was because I just wanted to open the door even wider and uh, give myself more options and see what else is on the table. I don't necessarily know what the future holds. And um, I think there's beauty in that. And I think we should not be afraid of not knowing. Um, and just, yeah, taking each day as it comes, but yeah, really going for it and not limiting yourself. Thanks so much for that question, Victoria. We'll go um, question from Debs, and then we've got a question at the back. We've got a question. And then who else? Any other questions? Edna? OK, so we'll go to Debs, and then Ills, and then Edna. Thank you so much. This is so important, this conversation. And I'll tell you for why. So I'm your mom, yeah? <laughs> I'm your mom. <laughs> and, and, and this is the kind of parental view. So. I'm going to couch what I'm going to say now with my own experience. So I've got three sons. And um, some years ago, my middle son came to me and said, you know, mom, he was at university, said, I want to do a side hustle. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And it was all around music. Um, and I remember thinking, and I think actually he'd, he'd finished university and he was working, and I was thinking, you know, you're going to do a side hustle and you've got a full-time job. How is this even possible? And then he said, Mom, you've got to get with a program. You know, you, sh you and Dad should have followed your dreams. And I said, you know, if we'd followed our dreams, we'd have grown all of you under a tree in the local park. <laughs> so why I'm, why I'm saying all of this is that I think this is a really important conversation for young people to be able to have with their parents to be able to explain to them how a side hustle can feature as a really important aspect of their life. So when they're... Their, um, their offspring is leaving the house at three o'clock in the morning to get to the studio, whatever it is. They don't sort of have all these random thoughts about this is going nowhere and what, what's going on with my child. So I suppose my question is, how does one, how do you prepare parents for this? And I actually think this talk should be on um, a university YouTube channel called um, University of Westminster, The Parents, because <laughs> 
really need to know this stuff. It's so important. So how does one prepare parents for the side hustle? That's a really good question. You know, like, my family, my, if my nan was here today, her side hustle would be making roti for every wedding and every church <laughs> ceremony. Do you know what I mean? That would be her, my auntie would be the baker. And, and the truth is, we come from families that often do things alongside their job. They just didn't call it side hustles. They just, they just got up and, now nah, we're trendy. We got TikTok and we can film it and da 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 da. But I just feel like... I come from generations of women who, who showed me this is how you have your house and your children and your marriage and whatever, but listen, it, the fun don't stop, you know, go and make sure you go and do this or go do a bit of sewing here and whatever. So I think for parents, what I would have liked for my mum to... And, I think it's just the lack of understanding. It's how do you do it? How are you at Westminster today and you got up and you went to Fulham this morning and what did you make from that? How, what bill did that pay? Like, if I was really transparent about my life and show, but it's long, like it's long to be like, oh, mum, the gas bill is this and today's money, da, da, da. but I think it's the, the trust and it's the um, interest. I think if parents were really interested and asked questions beyond how was your day, I think it would put parents a lot at ease to be like, oh, I get it and I get who your friends are and what. So my friends are DJs and they're out till 2 a.m. or my friends are, one girl bakes and she does bake. And I think when your job just doesn't look traditional, that's what the, the hurdle in the road is. It's like, this doesn't fit the traditional nine to five of what I'm used to. But remind your parents, be like, mom, what did you do in your day? My mom was bad man when she did badminton, you know? She would be D1 playing bad. And mom, that was your side hustle. That's what she goes, yeah, I guess, I guess I see what you mean. Come home from work, get changed and go. So the times haven't, like side hustles haven't changed. It's just how we talk about them or live them out, I guess, have changed. So um, yeah, man, I'm ready for the side hustle parent podcast. Maybe you should, maybe you should head it up, man. I'll be the guest, I'll be the guest, so. Yeah, no, I think Swazi killed it, um, especially in that like side hustles have always exist. Um, I think for me, one thing is like, not every goal needs to be a monetary goal. And I think what scares off a lot of black parents is like, well, how are you gonna make sense? How are you gonna make money? But like, what is, it, like, what is that doing to you? How are you expanding in ways of, of like that, that your normal job could have never gave you? Are you happy? Are you, are you actually coming, like, is it changing the way you're interacting with the world? Are you feeling more fulfilled? Are you feeling a place of belonging or through doing things that you think you enjoy? Whether I know as your parent and I'm trying to safeguard you and tell you, you need to be going to your accountancy job, I'm only just kind of, that's coming from a place of stability and also fear. Um, so it's like, if you genuinely know that you, you, you kind of love your, your child and you, you, you kind of want to provide the best place for them, allow them that place to also fail and see the, 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 the kind of the downfall of maybe working that many hours, he's going to be tired. And these are things that only he can understand when he's gone through an experience. Sometimes you want to go through the experience for them, but it's not. You need to allow him to walk his own journey and make sense of it in his own time. So for me and my parents, the way I prepared them for what I was doing was actually involving them in what I do, which I know is not um, always available, but I actually invited my mum to my first gig uh, when I was DJing, and that really just blew her away. Even though it was like a small little pub, it wasn't even anything crazy. But for her to, for her to see me doing something and see the passion and the joy that I was getting from that, I think that really just turned things around for her and she thought, okay, like you're actually happy because I think that's what parents want. They just want their children to be happy, right? So I think if you can try and translate that, even if it's, all right, so DJing's obviously, you know, you have to be physically there, but uh, depending on what you're doing, it could be selling, making and selling things. If you show them your website and um, just maybe involve them in the making, the creative process, I think that's all ways in which you can prepare them. Thank you so much for that question, Debs. And then, um, Ills, do you have a question? Hey guys, hey. you guys are smashing it, man. I'm really enjoying this, I'm buzzing. I came 10 minutes late and I'm so annoyed. I feel like I missed so much in those first 10 minutes. <laughs> but yeah, um, my question, well, was a, kind of a few questions. As uh, three young people who are destined to be legends, um, starting off side hustles and when things go wrong, when you have a bad day, what's your philosophy and like, how do you like recalibrate? Like, 
when, 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 you, when you're focusing on your day and, and it just doesn't go how you want it to go, how, how do you, yeah, what's your philosophy of getting through that, the ne- like starting, starting again the next day? Just quickly, I'll add, um, sometimes when something happens which annoys me, like, and then it puts me in a sour mood, I'm like, is this a bad day or is it a bad minute? Is this, and I'm not saying it's not always the case, sometimes your day can be a series of unfortunate events, but then sometimes something happens and then I look for the unfortunate events. I'm like, you know what, no, no, that happened, it set me off on the wrong foot. Yes, I'm gonna change the way that I interact with someone. Yes, I'm gonna change, and then it kind of validates and affirms that this was a bad day. Um, so I just think sometimes it's taking stock of like, oh cool, that, that weren't nice. Like, that wasn't nice. All right, that like, I identified as that, and now I'm kind of moving back in to this neutral space. Like, a day isn't bad or good, it just exists, right? And how I kind of see the things that happen to it are the ones that kind of give it its own character. So that's kind of my thing. Um, I, I, talking about events, I host loads of events, and one of the sinking feelings when people don't come to your events, and you're like, fam... I've actually spent better time on this. And you're like, what do you mean? So one of the things I think is, whoever came, it was for them. And once I recalibrate what I think, that person came, and do you know how many, like we came, we started doing events, and we throw events all the time, and some people will come, some people wouldn't, da 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 da. But I find that, you know, you, you circle back around, and someone will come to you and say, I remember that event, and I think, rah, if I banked on the five, 10, 15 people that came, I would never put on that event. Until someone says, I came to that event, and it slapped, and this is what I took away. And did you know that I met so and so, and da 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 da? So just don't take everything as a snapshot of what's going on, and don't discard something because you feel it didn't meet some fancy expectation that you had. Just do things faithfully. If you're faithful with the little, you'll be faithful with much. So I think if you just, yeah, sit back and take the wind from it, and that's a great, it's not a bad day, it's a bad minute. Take stock of those things. It really does shift how you, 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 some things you're not in control of. So I'm not God, I'm not sovereign. This is the event, this is the date, come. If you don't come, you missed out. So just rethink of it like that, and I think that's really helped me to overcome as a philosophy to move on and keep going. Quickly, just to add to that, because I didn't link it to side hustles, sometimes things are compound, like the compound effect. The idea that like only two people have come into your event, but this is slowly snowballing over time, and you can't always see the results of compound until maybe five, ten years, six months. Some people see it instantaneously, but yeah. So just believe that it's compounding, even when it doesn't look like life's offering you anything. So yeah, what gets me through is my big belief that whatever's for you won't pass you. And uh, that really, yeah, speaks to me and, and gets me through the, the tough times where I'm like, what is this? I'm not even sure if this is for me. Um, but yeah, I think if you just, yeah, carry a strong head on your shoulders, um, as hard as that can be, um, it, can, it can really work in your favor. Thank you so much, guys. I think we have one last question. Any other questions? We've got one last, questions from, one last question from Sarah, and that is it, and then we close. One last chance. No. Going twice, no? Nothing? All right, over to you, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna stand up, because I'm quite short. Um, thank you so much. Um, I also rocked up a little bit late, and as soon as I came in, you guys have just been giving me energy. Just, comp- you know, I was like, oh, I came over from another campus. I was like, oh, a bit late. Anyway, so thank you for that. Like, I really, on the end of a Friday, is, is, it's amazing. And my question for you, all three of you, is I know we're talking about change and responding to change and how you can, you know, adjust. And also how you guys like, started off in certain areas and then moved with your skills and your opportunities and moved to different areas. Considering all that, where do you see yourself in five years? Screenshot from right now, okay? So no big commitments, but like, where do you see yourself in five years? Thanks, that's it. Thanks, Sarah. So I actually try to avoid (laughs) 
those type of questions because it gives me anxiety. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, tr I try to give like a, a, a general view. Um, in five years, I see myself doing what I love and paving the way for others to come through, whatever that looks like. Thank you. <laughs> um, in five years, um, hopefully back here giving you guys another talk, like another opportunity to be like, man, five years ago I was here, and like, yo, like five years later, woo! <laughs> Um, what am I going to say? Yeah, do you know what? The, the, the celebration I did for Too Much Sauce last year celebrated five years. And the first Too Much Sauce, I think I had like maybe 30 people. The last one, I kid you not, it was like over 200 people. The barbecue were shook. They were like, where's all these people coming from? Da, 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 da. So five years is a great way to measure things. But it's also a great um, time to measure things. But it's also nice to frame the question, what do you still want to keep in five years' time? And so it's the same friendship circles. It's the same great people that I work with and that takes like love and care and to nurture because five years will go like that and you think where are you at where are you doing da, 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 da. so yeah the Sunday the second Sunday of the month I hope the goal setting will still be in Vapiano's I will be still be doing that my family do um, fancy dress every Christmas I still want to be doing fancy dress at Christmas so there are definitely things outside of work and side hustling that ensure that the juices and the flavors and the sauce of all the side hustle can continue. So, um, but do you know what? I want to be TV bad man, do you know what I mean? I want to be doing the Mo Gilligans and I want to do all of those things. But most importantly, I want to have all of the things that give me joy in life and, and more in five years time. So yeah, it's a great question to end on. Thank you. Woo! Thank you so much, everyone. You've been absolutely brilliant. Just to close the event, um, I'm just going to invite the brains behind World and Westminster, um, Alex, to say a couple of words. A round of applause. Woo! I don't know about the brains, actually. I think, Zara, you're the brains and the heart behind this, actually. <laughs> I don't even know if I've got the words to say a big enough thank you to you all for this fantastic session. It absolutely blew me away. Um, I think that one of the really big privileges for me of working at Westminster is that I've learned so much in this job that I didn't even know I didn't know. And this session was a really good example of that. You've talked about things around bravery, around taking risks, around embracing change, learning things about yourself, and grace, actually. I really like that notion of grace, the grace of what you're doing, the grace you can bestow through what you're doing. It was a massively humbling experience. I think you've been brilliant. I really hope that we keep on having this conversation. Thank you so much for being part of World in Westminster, and I'm sure everybody wants to join me in saying the biggest of thank yous to our panel, because this was a fantastic event. Do we know where Deborah is? Is Deborah? Deborah, perfect timing. Perfect, perfect timing. So another incredible person that you have to hear from before you leave, the absolute, the absolute everything behind Black History Year, behind Black History Year Create, behind everything that we're doing in terms of, in terms of you know, the brilliant BME network, everything. Deborah, husband's round, massive round of applause for Deborah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. I'm going to be really brief. You dropped some bars, you know. <laughs> you dropped some bars of wisdom. This was just so absolutely brilliant. And I, I really mean what I say. I mean, I, I think this needs to be preserved, and it will be anyway, it's recorded. But not only do our young people with a vision need to hear this, but as I was saying, their parents also need to understand that the vision is real and it needs to be supported. Because this is how you form identity. This is how you develop resilience. This is how you kind of explore and maintain your key competencies. This is how you change the world. I can drop bars too, you know. <laughs> so. So, I, I, have you done all the thank yous? Because there's just so many people to thank. I mean, obviously, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Really appreciate it. And to the audience as well for coming, for all the people behind the scenes. But, Zara, Zara. <laughs> so you got it. You're going to get it again. Zara, Zara, Zara. 
Because what we understand of Zara is that she's so well networked. You mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure our next guest will probably be like Obama, Michelle Obama or somebody else, because she just knows the whole world. And not only that, it's just her hard work, her vision, and her dedication that makes these kind of events a success. And you're absolutely right. You know, there's something I, I learned from this. I, I used to be very much hung up on numbers. So if 50 people didn't come through the door, I was like, mm, you know. And we also have this thing where, you know, if it's not enough people that meets our expectations, we'll even cancel the event. But what you've shown us is that sometimes it's just the five. It's sometimes it's just the one person that needs to be in the room because it was for them. And that's what you said, you know, sometimes it's just about, you know, me and my, my reason for being in the room at that time. I love your faith. I love the way that your whole world is just surrounded by your faith and you're not afraid to talk about it. I love your quiet confidence. I love the way you just exude that and the way you articulate yourself. I love the fact that you have a dream and you're prepared to go with it. I'm so proud of you. You are my children. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for, for attending. And for students as well, the one thing that I want to say is, I mean, this is, this is, these are, these are my friends. Th these are, this is my network. And literally, your network is your network. The people that you're sitting next to in your seminar in five years' time, you don't know what kind of powerhouses you are going to be, genuinely. And for all the students here, for all the students that made it today, thank you so much for making it. And for anyone who's going to watch this as well, I really hope you take away something from it as well. Thank you so much, everyone.